So it's really nice to be here. I have a lot of ties with Santa Cruz. Uh, my best friend in the world is Will Mayall, and he lives in Santa Cruz. He's here. Uh, I am an investor and advisor to a company called I Wonder, which is based in Santa Cruz for uh, digital rights management. So that is another connection. And, uh, <laughs> And we also own a house in Pajaro Dunes, so we at least drive past that cruise. Oh. <laughs> Although I have, to, I have to tell you that I often take uh, the summit road, so because uh, that that one seventeen connection can be, shall I say, challenging. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about enchantment. So this is an enchanting community. And I'd like to pass on some knowledge that I've gained uh, in my career, learning how to influence and persuade and enchant people. Uh, I'll give you a little more detail about my career. I worked for Apple from 1983 to 1987. I was Apple's software evangelist. So my job was to convince people to write Macintosh software. Um, this meant that I worked for the Macintosh division of Apple, uh, which was probably the largest collection of egomaniacs in the history of California. <laughs> That's saying a lot. Uh, record, we held that record for about 30 years until Facebook broke the record. Uh, you know, working for Steve, uh, it, Steve's division was a very interesting experience because we had very special rules. Unlike any other part of Apple, we had unlimited, you know, fresh orange juice and this kind of stuff. Now, this is back in the in the 80s, so that was a big deal back then. You know, none of this massage, free washer, dryer, um, chef on demand, Google stuff with volleyball courts and all that. Back then, free juice was a big deal. <laughs> um, we also had a great travel policy. Our travel policy was any flight over two hours qualified for first class. And I defined the two hours to begin at the moment I left my apartment. <laughs> I literally flew first class from San Francisco to Monterey uh, on Apple's nickel. I did that many times. Uh, you know, back then, the company was the Apple II division, which was making all the money, and the Macintosh division, which was spending all the money, because Macintosh was not shipping and Apple II was shipping. Uh, but we were such bad people, we would not let Apple II division people into our building. So if you can imagine working for a company where one part of the company is not allowed into another part of the company. Uh, that's what it was like. And so the Macintosh division uh, was the butt end of a very good joke. And the joke is, how many Macintosh division employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer is one. The Macintosh division employee holds up the light bulb and expects the universe to revolve around. <laughs> now, uh, how many of you use Macs in this room? Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, the Windows version of this joke because uh, I didn't see Microsoft as a sponsor. Uh, the Windows version of this joke is how many Microsoft employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer to that is none, because Bill Gates has declared darkness to his staff. I have, I have watched uh, high-tech speakers for about 30 years, and the two things that I notice about high-tech speakers are first that almost all of them suck. Uh, and secondly, uh, they also go long, and that is a deadly combination. Uh, and if you suck and your speech is short, it's okay. And if you're great and your speech is long, it's okay. But if you suck and go long, it's like being stupid and arrogant. It's a bad combination, you know. And so it's like long commute, no job opportunities. Um, so. So what I've done for my speaking career is I have embraced the top 10 format. I use the top 10 format for almost every speech. And the reason is that in case you think I suck, you know about how much longer I'll suck. Because <laughs> I have exactly 10 points in this speech, okay? So uh, this is the art of enchantment. Uh, God, Doug, I should have grabbed your, I should have grabbed your remote, your USB remote. and. Uh, the Logitech thing. We can once again test the plug and play aspect of Macintosh. Let's see if it recognizes this. Yeah, there's the USB there. Okay, so the ghost of Steve Jobs. 
Yeah. Yeah. Ah, Steve Jobs lives. So, first I wanted to show you this picture because I've never been filled with clueless. This is kind of a big day in my life. I thought it was a big deal to be on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, but to be on the same marquee with Clueless, I'm a truly right. It's better than Frozen. So, uh, so that's, that's what's outside. Um, now to a serious presentation. So the art of enchantment, top 10. The starting point of great enchantment is that you achieve likability. Because if you think about it, have you ever been influenced and persuaded by someone you did not like? Probably not. This is a picture that truly illustrates likability. This is Richard Branson. He and I are in Moscow together, uh, speaking at the same conference. He comes up to me and he says, God, you fly on Virgin. I say, Richard, I don't fly on Virgin because I'm United Airlines Global Service. I don't know why I'm Global Service. I don't know how I got to be Global Service. I'm not going to risk my Global Service status flying on your airline. And when I said that, he got down on his knees and he started polishing my shoes with his jacket. <laughs> So just FYI, this is the moment I started flying Virgin America. <laughs> and this is likability. This is Sir Richard Branson, billionaire, getting on his knees so I would fly on Virgin. Okay? Steve Jobs was a great CEO, but let me just point out something to you. <laughs> his knees never got worn out this way. He, you know, AT&T got down on their knees. Right, but Steve Jobs never got down on his knees, so someone could use an iPhone, iPod, iPad, Macintosh. Trust me when I tell you this. This is likability. So the start of great likability is a great smile. Uh, this is not a great smile. This is called a Pan Am smile. The problem with a Pan Am smile is that Pan Am flight attendant is not truly happy to see those passengers. She is grinning and bearing it. She is holding a pencil in her teeth. Right? She's faking that smile. A great smile is called a Duchenne smile. And the mark of a Duchenne smile, believe it or not, is not what's happening with your jaw and your teeth. The mark of a Duchenne smile is what's happening with your eyes. The eyes are the key to a great smile. In particular, you want crow's feet. <laughs> crow's feet is a good thing, okay? No more Botox, no more plastic surgery, you know, ladies, you're not getting older, you're getting more enchanting. <laughs> you, actually, <laughs> you actually want crow's feet. Now, this is Richard Branson close up. And I mean, you know, his crow's feet can hold water. I mean, <laughs> that is crow's feet. You actually want crow's feet. So the smile. Second thing is to learn to accept others. And if there is a community in the United States, it truly personifies accepting others. It must be Sam. So this is a woman who works in the tourist areas of Edinburgh. So she has a business model better than most Silicon Valley companies. Her business model is if you want to take her picture, you have to pay her one pound. Okay? Uh, but, but my illustration here is that if you want to be liked, you have to accept others for what they are, no matter how much jewelry they have in their face. No matter what gender, sexual orientation, religion, color, socioeconomic status. You know, have, think about it. Have you ever liked a person who you could just sense that that person wanted you to change to their expectation? Highly unlikely. So step two is to learn to accept others. Step three is to always default to yes. That is to always be thinking, yes, I will help this person when he or she asks me to do something. Most people default to no. They're ready to say no, they're prepared, they're defaulting to no, they don't want to be taken advantage of. And I will tell you that I have been defaulting to yes for a long time. And over the course of my career, I would say there have been maybe five people who tried to take advantage of me. Arguably those five people were not worth enchanting. But the upside of defaulting to yes, and therefore being more likable, far exceeds the downside of being taken advantage of. So default to yes. Next step is to achieve trustworthiness because you could be liked but not trusted. 
you could like Charlie Sheen, but that doesn't mean you trust Charlie Sheen. <laughs> it's a big difference between likability and trustworthiness. So the key to trustworthiness, I believe, is to understand the sequence of events. And the way trustworthiness works is you have to trust other people before they will trust you. This is not a chicken or egg. There is a definite sequence. The onus, the burden is upon you. Three examples. Amazon. You can buy a Kindle Lee book. You have seven days before you cannot return the book. Okay, you have seven days where you can return the book. No questions asked. Go to the website. Just click return. It's removed from you. Take it back. Many people could read a book in seven days. Many people could do that. But Amazon trusts you not to do that. And so therefore, I think many people buy books that they were on the edge of buying. Should I buy it or not? Okay. Trust. Another is Zappos. How many of you buy shoes from Zappos? Lots of you. Yes. So if someone had said to me, well, the business model for Zappos is we're going to enable women to buy shoes without trying them on, I would have told you you're nuts. <laughs> that, OK, maybe people will buy a book, although you really should go to a bookshop of Santa Cruz. But that's a different discussion. <laughs> many people will buy a book. People will buy a CD. People will buy a DVD. You know, what could go wrong with those things? But shoes? color, size, width, there's a lot of things that could go wrong with shoes. And yet, lots of women buy shoes from Zappos. And why is that? Because they trust Zappos. And why do they trust Zappos? Because Zappos has the world's best shipping policy. They will pay shipping both ways. Buy the shoes, if you don't like it, they will pay for the expense of you shipping it back to them. They trusted women, so women came to trust them. And the final great example, of course, is Nordstrom, where there's a story that someone once returned a used tire to Nordstrom. Nordstrom does not sell tires. <laughs> Nordstrom took the return of a tire. And I actually checked this story. It is a true story. Not that I would let the truth get in the way of a good story for a speech. <laughs> In case you're wondering, it is a true story. The point of this slide is to convince you that the way to be trusted is to trust first. The onus, the burden is upon you. The next thing is to become a baker, not an eater. An eater sees the world as a zero-sum game. There's only one pie. The pie is of limited size. Therefore, if other people eat the pie, I have less to eat. Bakers do not see the world this way. Bakers see the world as a non-zero-sum game. I can bake more pies. I can bake bigger pies. I can bake cookies. I can bake cakes. Everybody can get dessert, right? Bakers are much more trustworthy than eaters because bakers do not see your gain as their loss. Become a baker, not an eater. And the last thing, is to find something to agree on, no matter how small. Right? When you're trying to enchant people, you need to build some kind of bridge. Two examples. With Apple, in the mid-80s, we were trying to make Macintosh a spreadsheet database and word processing machine. We were essentially zero for three there. Okay? But along came this product called Aldous PageMaker. PageMaker created this great market for Apple called desktop publishing. I don't think that if, wait, I said that wrong. If PageMaker did not happen along, Apple would have died. PageMaker saved Apple. And imagine a world without Apple, right? So we'd all have phones with real keyboards, right? All of you iPhone users right now, it is 7.30, your batteries are dead. Right? <laughs> I'm surprised you all got here because GPS doesn't work, right? It would be a different world. I'm an Android fan, can you tell? So, so PageMaker saved Apple. PageMaker and desktop publishing was the first place that Apple and the market agreed that Macintosh was a useful computer. We tried spreadsheet, database, word processing. Didn't agree with the market. But the market said, yes, Macintosh is great for desktop publishing. I think desktop publishing was a gift from God to Apple, really. Saved Apple. And I believe in God. And one of the reasons why I believe in God is there is no other explanation for Apple's continued survival. <laughs>
Now, you may be wondering, what the hell does this picture of opera have to do with anything? So, it's another story. The story goes like this. Two Latin American countries, diplomatic crisis. They meet in a neutral third country. For days, they negotiate. They make no progress. Finding one chief diplomat says to the other chief diplomat, we need to resolve this situation by Friday. On Friday, I have to return home. The reason why I have to return home is I promised my wife I would take her to the opera. I really hate the opera, but my wife forces me to take her to the opera, so I have to return home. The other diplomat, who has agreed with nothing this person has said all week, says, uh-huh, so your wife forces you to take her to the opera too? My wife does the same thing. I also hate the opera. So they finally found something to agree on, and they built a relationship that solved the diplomatic crisis. Right? So whether it is a dislike of opera, whether it is a love of hockey or surfing or adoption or you know, find something, sushi, whatever it is, artisanal ice cream, whatever it is, find something to agree on when you're trying to enchant people. Anything will do. The next step is to actually perfect your product or service. Now, this is a lesson, me a culpa, that I learned because I have tried to enchant people with great stuff and I have tried to enchant people with crap. And I can tell you, it is a lot easier to enchant people with great stuff than crap. So I want to encourage you to create great stuff if you want to be enchanting. Um, this is called Guy's Golden Touch. Guy's Golden Touch is not whatever I touch turns to gold. I wish that was true. Guy's Golden Touch is whatever is gold, Guy touches. Okay? <laughs> So the key to evangelism is to find something great or create something great so it's easy to evangelize, like go with the flow. So what makes great stuff? First of all, great stuff is deep, lots of features, lots of functionality. You've anticipated what people will need as they come up the power curve. Great stuff is also intelligent. When you look at this thing, you say, wow, this company understood my needs. This company understood my pain. This company understood what I could use. This is an analog example. This is a GT500 Shelby Mustang. It has 650 horsepower. This is a total badass Mustang, okay? For those of you in Santa Cruz who are like into Priuses, this is 6.8 Priuses. <laughs> so, I would love to buy one of these cars. I'd love to. I'm 59 years old. I'm going through a midlife crisis. I have feelings of impotency, inadequacy, shortcomings, etc., etc. So, what a great way to compensate for my feelings of inadequacy, right? Well, herein lies the problem. Uh, I have four children. My children are 8, 12, 18, and 21. And the 18 and 21 are both boys, both have licenses. And I know that no matter how carefully I plan my life, there will be chances where they might have to drive my car. <laughs> and the thought of either of them driving a 650 horsepower Mustang is just immoral. <laughs> luckily, luckily, Ford, in case you ever decide to do something like this to compensate for your feelings of inadequacy. Um, Ford has created something called the My Key, and what the My Key enables you to do is program the top speed of the car into the key. So on those rare occasions where my teenage boys might have to drive my car, they will get a key programmed to go no faster than 55 miles. <laughs> Tell me, is that an intelligent product? That is a very intelligent product. Next thing is that great products are complete. You know, it's the totality of the experience. It's not just the software. It's the support, too. It's the APIs. It's the documentation. It's the webinars. It's the conferences. If you buy a car, it's not just the steel and the leather and the rubber. It's the totality of the sales experience and the support experience. Great products are complete. Great products are also empowering. They make you feel better about yourself. They make you more creative, more productive. They give you peace of mind. This is the difference between Macintosh and Windows, right? Macintosh makes you more powerful, more creative, more productive. Windows, you have to fight. You have to wrestle it to the ground and defeat Windows. Right? It doesn't become one with you. You are forever trying to defeat that operating system. That's the crucial difference between Macintosh and Windows. 
Great products are empowering. And finally, great products are elegant. Somebody cared about the user interface design. So what I'm asking you, if you really want to be enchanting, ask yourself, are you creating a product that's deep, intelligent, complete, empowering, and elegant? Are you properly rolling the dicey? The fourth step is actually launching your product or service. The key to an enchanting launch is that you tell a story, a personal story. Why does your product exist? Why does your service exist? Why did you start the company? Why did you start the website? Most high-tech CEOs stand up and they say, I have patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting, <laughs> enterprise class, scalable product, right? It's as if every other CEO in the valley says, I have a piece of crap that's buggy, hard to use, and slow. <laughs> so every once in a while, a CEO stands up and says, I have something fast, and powerful, and easy to use, and scalable. Fact is, everybody uses the same adjectives. So the adjectives do not matter. Instead, you should tell a story, some great stories. Story number one, my buddy and I were frustrated that the only place you could use a computer was what? Driving to a government agency, driving to a university, going to a bank, working for the bank. Why couldn't computers be smaller and cheaper and easier to use? So we started Apple. What a great story. How about eBay? eBay's story is Pierre Almagnard's girlfriend was a Pez collector. She needed a way to sell Pez collectors' collections online. There was no way for her to do it. So he says he started eBay to enable his girlfriend to sell Pez dispensers online. By the way, that is a total bullshit story. <laughs> Just FYI. But it is a great story nonetheless. <laughs> great story nonetheless. The point here is to tell a personal story. The next thing in a launch is to plant many seeds. You know, marketing 1.0 used to be top down. You sucked up to the Wall Street Journal, and then they told on Thursday everybody to use your spreadsheet, and everybody listened to the Wall Street Journal, and they made Lotus 1, 2, 3 successful, right? So you sucked up to the high people, they told the great unwashed masses what to do, life was good. But I think now with social media, with Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and Pinterest and Instagram, it's not true anymore. I'm not saying you should ignore those powerful people, okay, at the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, CNN, Wired, Verge, whatever it is, right? Verge, the website, not the coffee shop. And I'm not saying you should ignore them, but I'm telling you that, you know, nobodies are the new somebodies. The, the proverbial lonely boy 15 at AOL.com, okay, who happens to love your product and tells his 15 friends who tell their 15 friends, all right? Lonely boy 15 is still living with his mother. Lonely boy 15 is sleeping on Buzz Lightyear sheets, okay? But lonely boy 15 could make your product hit. Twitter is an example of this. So Twitter, I think, is about eight or nine years old now. And there's no coverage of Twitter that's eight or nine years old that said at that moment that Twitter was beginning, I have seen the future of communications. It is a company called Twitter. They enable you to send 140 character text messages like, my cat rolled over. <laughs> the line at Starbucks is long. This is a revolution in communication. Nobody predicted that someday Twitter could take down governments. The fact is that Twitter became successful because the lonely boy 15s, the unknown people who attended South by Southwest, loved Twitter to tell people which were the good panels and which were the good parties. It wasn't the Wall Street Journal predicting the success of Twitter. It was a bunch of people who you never heard of at South by Southwest. Again, I'm not telling you to ignore the top of the pyramid, but I'm telling you that you have to plant many seeds. It's not just the top of the pyramid anymore. Next point is to use salient points to describe your innovation, your revolution. On the left side, you see what an industry likes to use. On the right side is what I wish an industry would use. Let's pretend you're in the food business. Okay, so you go to a market, you pick up a bag of chips, you turn it over, you put your reading glasses on because in four-point gray type, there is an explanation of the nutritional contents of that bag. 
you see that that bag has two servings, 150 calories each. So it's 300 calories in that bag of chips. Question is, what is 300 calories, right? Wouldn't it be better if you turned that bag over in a city? If you eat this bag of chips, you have to run 25 miles. <laughs> that would be a much better way to communicate what's in the bag. I'm not, selling you, I'm not saying you'd sell more chips, but it's a much better way. Another thing is not-for-profit. Not-for-profit love to talk in terms of dollars. How big is our fund? A much better way is to talk in terms of months of food for families. When someone is donating to a not-for-profit, they don't, they don't care about the size of the fund. They want to know if we give you $250, it'll buy food for 12 months for a family in Ethiopia. That's the salient point of a donation. And in the gadget business, I refuse to believe that people wake up in the morning and say, God, if I only had 16 gigabytes more of storage, my life would be complete. People wake up in the morning saying, I want something cool and thin and beautiful that can hold a thousand movies and 10,000 songs and a hundred thousand books. We're talking in terms of songs and books and movies, not gigabytes. So I'm asking you to consider using the stuff on the right side, the salient description of what you do. Next thing is to overcome resistance to your enchantment. This is a slide that shows some successful overcoming of resistance to a product. Okay, in the mid 80s, Nintendo had a problem because retailers no longer wanted to stock electronic games. The electronic game business was tarnished. And so Nintendo realized it had a problem, and what it did is very clever. It added a robot to its electronic game and called it an educational toy. Very clever, right? So now kids were asking their parents for an educational toy to learn <laughs> robotics. Tell me as parents, which would be more effective, educational toy to learn robotics or electronic game to shoot stuff up? <laughs> it was a brilliant repositioning by adding a robot. That's how they overcame resistance. More ways to overcome resistance. One is to use this social phenomena that there's social proof. And I think Apple did this brilliantly with the iPod. They had iPods with white earbuds. Pretty soon you figured out white earbud equals iPod. You started noticing white earbuds. The more white earbuds you saw, the more comfortable you were with buying an iPod. Eventually you bought an iPod because resisting Apple is futile. <laughs> <laughs> so guess what? When you bought an iPod, you added to the pool of white earbuds. So the more white earbuds, the more iPods, the more iPods, the more white earbuds. It became this beautiful upward spiral. So think of ways that you can provide social proof that people are using your product. The next thing is to use a data set to change a mindset. So I think there are still mindsets in this world that's very difficult to overcome. One mindset is what this data set is going to disprove. So this is in 1950, the vertical axis shows the lifespan of people, the horizontal axis shows the number of children born per woman in countries, okay? So the colors depict where the countries are. So in 1950, it's more or less accurate to say if you lived in America, you had a long life and few kids. If you lived in Western Europe, that was true too, but in the rest of the world, you had a lot of kids and a short life, right? 1950. I think to this day, many people, particularly Americans, would believe this, that other than in America, everybody has lots of kids and they die young, okay? But let me show you what happens in the next 59 years. In the next 59 years, guess what? The whole world is shifting into that upper left-hand corner. Everybody is getting a lifespan of 75 years and two to two and a half kids, except for Africa, except for Africa. So this is an example when you have a data set, you can use the animation of data set to change a mindset. So if you ever have an issue where you're trying to overcome resistance to your enchantment, where people have a set thought, a stereotype that's set in their mind, see if you can use the animation of data to change a mindset. 
The, this example is from a company called, or an organization called Gapminder, G-A-P-M-I-N-D-E-R. And if you go to the gapminder.org site, you'll see a lot more examples of stuff like this. The last way to overcome resistance is to be sure you enchant all the influencers. I think many, many organizations assume that it's always the father. You would be wrong, I think, 80% of the time. It's really the mother. That's the chief influencer. Sometimes it could be the sister-in-law. Sometimes it could be the grandfather. In my particular family, it's the daughter. Okay? <laughs> so I have a 12-year-old daughter. How many of you men have daughters? Okay, so you understand that your happiness is gated by your daughter's happiness, which is to say you cannot be any happier than your daughter is. Right? That's just the way it is. Okay, so if you really wanted to reach me, you would make my daughter happy. That's the way you do it. Okay? So I'll give you proof. I have been to not one, but two Justin Bieber concerts. <laughs> is there any more solid proof? You've been to two? Two? I don't know. Actually, you know, Justin Bieber's concerts are pretty enjoyable. I have to say. I have to say. I mean, yeah, okay, so seriously, so, you know what? At any given point, people who are like, let's say, 40 and older, we always say teenagers' music is crap, right? So, like, my father, when he was a teenager, loved Guy Lombardo. I bet his father said, oh my god, Guy Lombardo and the Royal Canadians, what kind of noise is this, right? And so now we're all looking and we're saying, Michael Jackson, man, that was really great music. But at the time, our parents said, what are you listening to? You know, what kind of crap are you listening to? So right now we're all saying, Justin Bieber, oh my god, how crappy. But someday, it's going to be Justin Bieber's, like the classic, right? You're shaking your head. I'm telling you, that day will happen. So... Okay, don't believe me. <laughs> don't get stuck up on my Justin Bieber theories. Um, remember, enchant all the influences. The next step is to make your enchantment endure. The Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead has endured for decades, right? Decades. How is that? Well, one reason is because the Grateful Dead thinks differently. At a Grateful Dead concert, there is an area set aside for tapers. Not that anybody uses tape anymore. The Grateful Dead has figured out that the most hardcore Grateful Dead fan comes to the concert. They enable these Grateful Dead fans to tape the concert and then share the music. While the rest of the music industry is suing little old ladies for downloading cello music, <laughs> the Grateful Dead is essentially encouraging piracy of its music, right? Because it wants the Grateful Dead evangelists to go find more Grateful Dead fans. That's one of the reasons why the Grateful Dead has endured. Next way is to build an ecosystem. That is to build a total offering that includes external parties, right? So, iOS is a much stronger product because there are tens of thousands of iOS programmers. Android is the same way. Imagine a world where it was only Google or only Apple creating apps for Android or iOS. It would be, it's kind of like owning a Blackberry. It would be a very boring world. It would suck, actually. In the software business, it's not just the DVD. It's not just the download. It's the conferences. It's the APIs. It's the documentation. It's the totality of it. In the restaurant business, it's not just the food. It could be the waiter and waitress union. It could be the valet service that parks the cars of your clients. It could be the local organic farms that supply stuff for the restaurant. It's the totality of the restaurant. When you have an ecosystem, the ecosystem can do things that you are unable to do or unwilling to do. Apple user groups. Apple user groups kept Apple going through the dark years of the Macintosh. Harley-Davidson Harley owners groups, the hogs, also they keep Harley going. They provide things that Harley cannot provide. The point here is to build an ecosystem. The next point is to invoke reciprocation. Reciprocation is a very powerful way to make your enchantment last. This carpet depicts reciprocation. So the way this works is in the 1930s, Italy invaded Ethiopia. When Italy invaded Ethiopia, the people of Mexico collected money and sent money to Ethiopia to help the Ethiopians defend their country. 
About 90 years later, a big earthquake in Mexico. The people of Ethiopia collect money and send it back to Mexico to reciprocate. The great part of the story is that at the time, Ethiopia was going through a famine. So even though Ethiopians were starving, they still felt the need to reciprocate because Mexico had helped Ethiopia nine decades earlier. After the Civil War, the people of Charleston bought the people of, excuse me, the people of New York bought the people of Charleston a fire truck because they heard that in Charleston, the way the fire department worked was a bucket per day. Okay? The first fire truck was on a boat that sank, so the people of New York bought them two fire trucks. Fast forward 150 years, guess what? 9-11. What did the people of Charleston do? They raise half a million dollars and they buy the people of New York a fire truck. This is 150 years later. That's how powerful reciprocation is as a force in society. Uh, I think the world's greatest expert on reciprocation and really influence is this guy, Bob Cialdini. Uh, great book. I highly recommend this book. It should be required reading for everybody in business. And when an author tells you to read somebody else's book, there is no higher form of praise. Okay? So I want you all rush over to Bookshop of Santa Cruz and place this order. Okay? This is a great, great book. It should be required reading for everybody in business. Okay? So I'm going to give you two power tips about reciprocation. Okay, Marty, you will be my subject. So, let's say that I, I think like a baker, not an eater, and I default to yes, and I do something for you, okay? So, she thanks me, okay? So the question is, what is the optimal response to her now? The optimal response is not simply a welcome. The optimal response is, I know you would do the same for me, right? I know you would do the same for me. I'm telling her she has class. She's a good person. I know you would do the same for me. I'm also telling her, I know you will do the same thing. <laughs> That's the optimal response. Second point, now she knows she owes me, right? And I could be a real man, she say, nah, I'm kidding, you really don't owe me nothing, okay? Forget about it. But you know what, that's not the optimal thing to do also. The optimal thing is for me to tell her how to pay me back. Because she may want me to do more for her. And I, as a baker and a defaulter to yes, I am happy to do more for you. It is my pleasure to help you, but I am not clairvoyant. So our relationship would be stuck if I did not tell you how you can pay me back. So she can pay me back, clear the decks, and then she can ask me to do more. That is the power tips of reciprocation. Okay? I know you would do the same for me, and this is how you can pay me back. Completely counterintuitive. But power tips of reciprocation. The next thing is to never rely on money if you're trying to make reciprocal, excuse me, if you're trying to make enchantment last. You know, if you are likable and you are trustworthy and you have a dicey product or service, you don't have to rely on money. If you have to rely on money, arguably you are either not likable, not trustworthy, or you have a piece of crap. I'm not saying I'm against money. Of all people in the world, I would not say this, okay? I believe in commissions. I believe in affiliate fees. I believe in all that great stuff. But that should not be the core of why someone is enchanted with you. It can make stuff better, but it should not make stuff possible. Because someone can always outbid you if it comes down to money. Don't rely on money. Next thing is that great, great enchanters are great presenters. If you want to enchant people, if you want to influence and persuade them, you have to learn to present, to speak publicly. Step number one is to customize the introduction. Customize the introduction means that you show that you know who you're talking to, that this is not just the same old speech given over and over again. You need to customize the introduction. You only need to do this for a couple minutes, right? Customize the introduction. I like to use pictures. This is a picture of LG washer and dryer in my house. Scenario here is that I was in Sao Paulo. I was speaking to the LG management of South America. However, I, I really didn't plan this trip very well, so I was already in Brazil when I decided, you know, guy, it would be really clever if you started off your LG presentation with a picture of your LG washer and dryer. Huh, but we live in the world of communication, right? So I thought I'd invoke a little reciprocation from the two boys I don't want driving a Mustang. So, I send them little text messages, you know, kids, stop playing Assassin's Creed for a second that I bought you. 
on the Xbox that I bought you. Go downstairs in the house that I bought you. With your iPhones that I bought you. Take a picture of the washer and dryer that I bought you. I'm in Brazil, I need this right away. Okay? How many of you have teenage boys? Okay, so you know, no pictures came, right? right. <laughs> so now you have to catalyze reciprocation sometimes, right? Send a little follow-up text message. So just so you understand the situation, Nick is the older boy. Noah is the younger boy. Nick, Noah, okay? So I send a follow-up text message to my son, Nick. I said, Nick, did you get my text messages? Because I'm not seeing those pictures, right? Nick says, oh, Noah's going to take the pictures. And by the way, can you get us some free LG TVs? <laughs> And then there's like, there's defaulting to yes, and there's also stupidity. <laughs> that was my response. Noah did come through. He did come through. And if you start a speech in South America to the LG management, showing your LG washer and dryer, trust me when I tell you, it really starts the speech well. More pictures that I've used. This is when I was in Russia with Richard Branson. I opened up my speech in Moscow with this picture from Red Square. And I said, you know what, man? You Russians, you really have big balls. <laughs> and this is before Crimea. Okay. Truth this. So, so, I mean, the Russian crowd just loved that I would open up with this picture of this cannon that fired once and cracked. So, you know, it worked. Um, this is a picture when I was in Scotland. I went to this place called Crombies and I investigated this thing called Haggis, which is kind of the Scottish version of poi. And, uh, but, you know, I can't tell you that I enjoyed it, but, you know, when you open up a speech in Scotland with something like this, you go on there. But this is the best illustration of this concept of all. This is me in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul. How many of you have been to Istanbul? Istanbul, arguably, is the second most enchanting city in the world next to Santa Cruz. It is a fantastic city. Fantastic city. I just love Istanbul. I would go to Istanbul anytime. Will and I have been, how many times have we gone? Twice? Four times? Oh, three. Yeah, we, oh, I love Istanbul. Um, so anyway, let me set the stage for you here. So I'm obviously in the Grand Bazaar. The guy behind me is the shopkeeper. He's got glasses on, trust me when I tell you. Well, you can probably see, this is a great projector. That guy has a Duchenne smile. That's a real smile. You know what he's thinking? He's thinking, this dumbass American is going to buy this face. <laughs> That's a really sincere smile. He's thinking, this dumbass American, I've had this face in my shop for two generations. <laughs> and I finally found some dumbass tourist from America who's going to buy this face. I bring joy wherever I go. <laughs> you know? So trust me when I tell you, when you start a speech in Turkey with you wearing a fence in the Grand Bazaar, can you tell that story? Great start to a speech. So, Messages, customize your introduction. Second thing you should do is sell your dream. Position whatever you're introducing, whatever you're talking about, as a dream of empowerment, productivity, creativity, peace of mind, the democratization of computing, the democratization of information, the democratization of commerce. If you're Etsy, you're democratizing craft, whatever it is, right? Sell your dream. When Steve Jobs introduced an iPhone, he did not stand up and say, I have $188 worth of parts manufactured under somewhat suspect conditions in China. <laughs> That's not how he positioned a new iPhone. He said an iPhone is thin and cool and beautiful. It's an app for that. Sell your dream. The last thing is the 10-20-30 rule of PowerPoint. The Guy Kawasaki rule of PowerPoint. 10-20-30. The optimal number of slides in a PowerPoint presentation is 10. 10. You'll be lucky to get 10 thoughts across in a presentation. You're a smart audience. You have like daggers of incredible incre disbelief. <laughs> you're thinking, like, guy, you know, you're such a hypocrite. You're telling us to use 10 slides. You're on like number 40 right now, right? Yeah. You know, what's up with that, right? Let me explain. You are not me. <laughs> The 20 part of this is that even though you have an hour, you should give your presentation in 20 minutes. You should be able to give your presentation in 20 minutes. You may not have to give it every time, but you should be prepared to give it in 20 minutes. Why is this? It is because, much to my chagrin, to this day, 90% of the world uses Windows. And I know 
that if it's a one-hour meeting and someone is going to use a Windows laptop, I should budget in 40 minutes to make the projector work. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. You mean longer? Longer? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Bring your Windows laptop on radar. Put it up. Let's see. Let's see. I would bet I would bet you pink slips, but I don't want your computer. Um, if the whole world used Macintoshes, it would be the 10-60-30 rule. 10-20-30. The 30 is the optimal font size. The optimal font size is 30 points. 30 points. A very good rule of thumb is figure out who the oldest person is in your audience, divide his or her age by two. 60-year-old people, divide by two, 30. 50-year-old, divide by two, 25. Someday if you be pitching a 16-year-old VC, God bless you, that day use the eight-point font. <laughs> but until that day, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30-point font. Number eight, we are in a great time to use technology to enchant people. Imagine Dale Carnegie, 1930s. What could Dale Carnegie do? What kind of leverage did Dale Carnegie have? He could fill a ballroom in New York with several hundred people. He didn't have blogs, websites, email. He didn't have MailChimp, Pinterest, Google+, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. He had none of that. He could fill a ballroom. We have all that. It is the easiest time ever to be enchanting using technology. The start of using technology, however, is to remove the speed bumps. This is a screenshot of CAPTCHA. The purpose of CAPTCHA is to reduce the number of customers you have, right? <laughs> so, the word on the left is Holberg, I think. No problem. The word on the right. Okay, so uh, how many of you in this audience know what language that is? Okay, so like 10 of you. So of the 10 of you who know that's Hebrew, do you have a Hebrew keyboard? No. Oops. So in this audience of 500 people, none of you could have been past this CAPTCHA. And the ironies of all ironies, and I wish I could tell you I planned it and I worked so hard. I went through site after site, registering and registering and registering, until one of the captures presented the Hebrew word for obstacle. <laughs> it's not true. I just took this by accident and somebody said, God, did you realize that that is the Hebrew word for obstacle? Holy cow. What great luck. <laughs> so, here's a positive example. It's a company called Sungevity Real Estate, not real estate. They install residential solar panels. One of the speed bumps in solar panels is you have to set up the appointment, they come out, look at your house, you have to be there, they have to show up, you know, lots of aggravation, right? Sungevity is very clever. They just ask for your home address, they look, at you up, look you up on a satellite photo. From that satellite photo, they make a mock-up of your house with the solar panel. They can figure out how big the panel is, about how much power it will put out, how much it will cost. All you had to do was give it your home address. That is removing a speed bump. Remove the speed bumps. Next thing. If you want to be successful in social media and enchanting people, I think you have to provide value. So the model I like to use is what I call the NPR model. The NPR model, according to me, is that they provide great content 365 days a year. Wait, wait, don't tell me. This American life, right? Tech nation, fresh air, all this great, great stuff. Every once in a while, they run the telethon. Why do we tolerate the telethon? Why do we even give money during the telethon? It's because we feel a sense of obligation and reciprocation. We're crying out loud, NPR has no advertising the rest of the year. They don't charge us for this great stuff. The least we can do is tolerate the telethon and donate money. That is working reciprocation. So this is my model for social media. I want to provide you so much value that when I promote my book, my company, you do not feel any hostility towards me for doing that because I have been providing you great stuff all year long. Provide value. None of us really like the telethon. None of us really want to get the, you know, the Eton hand crank emergency radio. <laughs> where if you donate $10 per month, the people of, you know, Plantronics is going to match you dollar for dollar. And with this Eton hand crank radio, in the event of nuclear war, you can crank it and find out how you're going to die. <laughs> Who among us lusts for that radio? You know? 
provide value. So what kind of value can provide by social media? One is information, what just happened. Second thing is insights, what does it mean that this just happened? And finally, assistance, how to avoid a bad thing, how to get a good thing. That's the three kinds of information you should provide on social media. 80 to 90% of the time, that's what it should be. The next thing is some standards of engagement. I think you have to engage very fast now. I think the life of a tweet is four or five hours. You know, Facebook posts, four or five hours. Email, a couple of days. I wish I could tell you I answered every email in 48 hours. I don't. But that's what I should do. It's fast. It's also flat. Don't forget, lonelyboy15 at AOL.com. He could be the person that makes you tip. Doesn't have to be somebody at WSJ.com or TechCrunch.com or Mashable.com. It could be lonelyboy15. The last person still on AOL, okay? It could be lonely boy 15 that makes you tip. And finally, you have to do this all the time now. All the time, all the time. Social media is no longer something that you do when everything else is done. Social media is core to the existence of companies at this point. Next point, how do we change your boss? Very tactical. When your boss asks you to do something, drop everything else and do it. It is literally that simple. It's not optimal, I admit. It's also not fair, I admit. But I'm telling you what works. When your boss asks you to do something, drop everything else. Men in this audience, let me give you some marital advice. <laughs> when your wife asks you to do something, drop everything else. Right? Don't sit there arguing and explaining to her why what you're doing is more important than what she's asking you to do, because you are wrong. Okay. <laughs> Just drop everything else. When you drop everything else, the next step is to prototype fast. The beauty of prototyping fast, and this is the prototype that led to this presentation. This is what I sent to the graphic designer. I wanted to get a quick prototype off. You want to show the person that you dropped everything else. How do you do that? You should send her a prototype. You say, you wanted me to make a PowerPoint presentation? I just made one with just the text. I dropped some graphics in. Am I headed in the right direction? This has two beautiful effects. One is that it provides proof that you've dropped everything else. Secondly, it gives you as much time as possible to truly provide a great finished product. The third way to enchant your boss is to deliver bad news early. The concept that you should deliver bad news late at the very last possible moment, because prior to the last possible moment, the miracle will occur and the bad news won't happen is flawed. I have never seen it work like that. What you should do is you should tell your boss about the potential for bad news so that you have as much time as possible for fixing the bad news. That's how to enchant your boss. More importantly, how to enchant people who work for you. Uh, I, I got the majority of this message from a book called uh, Drive by Daniel Pink. Daniel Pink basically says to pay people adequately but then if you want to take it to the next level and truly enchant your employees, you provide a map. The M in map stands for mastery. Come work for us and you will master new skills. You will be a better programmer, better social media person, better artist, better cook, better waiter, whatever it is. You'll master new skills. You'll be working autonomously, independently. We're not going to breathe down your neck, this company. And finally, you'll be working towards a higher purpose. Not simply making a buck, but making the world a better place. Provide a map to your employees. By the way, you know, a lot of people are taking um, pictures of this stuff. I, I will be happy to provide you a PDF, because I know all your phones are about to die. So, um, so Doug, I'll, I'll give you the PDF for this. You can provide it to anybody you want. I mean, are you, are you recording this? You can also put that anywhere you want. I'm not parent. Just put it in. Just cover the earth up there. So, um, you know, I, I've met a lot of speakers, and they really like, they freak out, and they don't want to put out their presentation, they don't want to put out their video, because they figure that, wow, if people could watch them on YouTube for free, they won't hire them for speaking engagement. And my logic is, if you're telling me a YouTube video is just as good as you live, you should not be hired for speaking <laughs> Anyway, where was I? So, the next step, the next step is to empower your employees, to basically say to them, I think you're smart, I think you're good, you don't have to check with me. Make the decision. I empower you. And the last thing, the way to enchant your employees is to suck it up. <laughs> is to suck it up. And um, how many of you watch Dirty Jobs? I love Dirty Jobs. 
What makes Mike Rowe so enchanting? It's the fact that he sucks it up, right? He will work in the factory. He'll work in the poi factory, the paint factory. He'll clean the outside of the skyscrapers in Honolulu. He'll get the dead rats from the sewer. He'll perform artificial insemination on chickens, turkeys, pigs, cows, llamas. <laughs> he will do whatever it takes. Mike Rowe will do the dirty job. That's why he's so enchanting. You need to be a boss like Mike Rowe. Your employees should believe that you are willing to do the dirty job, and you are not asking them to do something that you yourself would not do. So if you have a, if you have a development center in Bangalore, you know what? If you're telling them to fly coach to come visit, you fly coach to visit them. Never ask your employees to do something that you would not do. Suck it up. And this is my last slide. My last slide is just to reiterate the key pillars of enchantment. The key pillars of enchantment are number one, likability. Remember, Richard Branson got down on his knees so that I would fly on Virgin. That's likable. You also want to be trustworthy. Zappos pay shipping both ways. That's how much they trust women. And finally, like I said, it is much easier to enchant people with great stuff than crap. And great stuff has five qualities. Deep, intelligent, complete, empowering, and elegant. These are the three pillars of the art of enchantment. Thank you very much.